nice to be here. I feel very honored to be able to, to share this with you. I can really relate to Mary, to her heartbreak, to her pain, to how proud she must have felt at times, and the horror and heartbreak she must have experienced. I, I think whenever you have children, there are a lot of emotional highs and lows. And so this is very, this is a very strong, a very comforting thing for me. It really is. Um, I'm going to talk about maybe a little bit differently from a different view than some of the others have. But um, I'm going to start with reading to you from John chapter 19, yeah. verses 26 and 27. Now Jesus is up on the cross. It's been a very long day and night. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the wow. disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then he saith to the, to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Seven words. Two simple statements made by Jesus as he was dying on the cross. Seven words spoken to two different people standing at the cross. Who were these people and what was the significance of the words that he was speaking to them? And how do they apply to us today? The woman was Mary, the mother of Jesus. The other was John, the disciple of Jesus. One called the one whom Jesus loved. Both, I'm sure, they were there because they wanted to be there for Jesus and not yet realizing that he was there on that cross for them. Two people who may have walked the very same streets of the city to get to the place where the cross was, but whose journeys had been very different. The woman was Mary, the mother of Jesus, wife of Joseph, who had lived a very extraordinary life when she was just a young girl, a virgin. The angel Gabriel had appeared to her and told her, that she would give birth to a child. She would be impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And this child would be special. He would be the Messiah. Mary was a devout Jewish woman. She knew that from her lineage, the Messiah would come through her line, the line of David. But to actually be spoken to by an angel when you're a virgin, about to be married, and particularly in the days when Mary lived, to be told you're going to have a baby when you've never been with a man was a very extraordinary thing. And yet, listen to Mary's response. Now, she knew she could be stoned. She knew Joseph could just leave her. And yet, these are her words, and I want to get them right. Her response was, let it be done to me according to what you have said. How incredible that must have been. In spite of being troubled and aware of how bad this could look for her, Mary acquiesced to the word of God. So she received the word of God in her spirit and in her heart. And as the psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart. And Mary received that word in her womb. The word of God came alive in Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Mary believed God in spite of the circumstances, and God looked after all of the details. And that's something we have to remember. Believe God. Let him look after the details. Joseph didn't leave Mary. God spoke to him. He married her in spite of the fact that she could have been stoned to death. Nothing happened. 
And in spite of giving birth in a stable, both Mary and the baby were just fine. God was in all of the details. God announced to the shepherds that this baby was the anointed one, wonderful counselor, Emmanuel, God with us. All that Mary had been told came to pass. Mary knew God was faithful. She had the honor and privilege of bearing the Son of God, and she treasured him and nurtured him, who was the Word made flesh. How thrilled she must have been, how in awe of it all she must have been, at times perhaps a little overwhelmed, maybe feeling unworthy, maybe even inadequate, to be responsible for this special gift that God had given her. And yet what joys she must have experienced holding that little baby in her arms, the tenderness she must have felt kissing away his childhood tears. Her heart must have almost burst with pride and love as she watched this son begin his ministry at age 30. This son who was the promise. Hearing him speak such words of wisdom, witnessing water turn into wine, the deaf hearing, the blind seeing, leopards being cleansed and restored, even dead people coming back to life. This was incredible, and that was her son, teaching, preaching, healing, doing good to all. How many times did she remember everything that she had personally been told by an angel of the Almighty God? Jesus would be great, would be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God would give him the throne of his father David, his reign, he would reign over the house of Jacob throughout the ages, and of his kingdom there would be no end. And then the triumphant ride into Jerusalem. Finally, people were seeing Jesus as he really was. How her heart must have been thrilled. She, she must have felt that everything was vindicated. God was on the throne. Praise God. How faithful. She must have considered herself truly a blessed woman. And then, the unthinkable. He was arrested. If anyone has ever had a loved one, a child, someone you've cared about, arrested, no matter what the circumstances, you know how you feel about that person. Whether whether the circumstances are warranted or not, you love that person and you want to be there for them. And it's horrific. He was taken prisoner and yet he came to set the captives free. What wonderful miracle will release him? I know what's going through her mind. What wonderful miracle will release him? And then, no release, he's beaten horribly. Have you ever seen your child or a loved one being beaten or perhaps in a horrible accident or maybe with tubes coming out of them after a serious operation? It's a really horrendous thing to see. You wish it could be you instead of them suffering that. You would like to bear that for them. Your heart almost stops. It's, it's an unthinkable thing but no release. Instead, a public whipping. And let me tell you something, the Romans were very good. They had perfected that form of torture. Mary had seen this happen before to other people, but now it was happening to her son. Tortured, humiliated, almost unrecognizable. With every crack of the whip, with every moan, with every groan, with every cry. As a mother, she can hardly breathe. This is her child, and he's heaven sent. How could this be happening? She wants to scream, stop, no more, take me, don't take him. He's only going to do good things for you. But that didn't happen. She remembers 
his passion for his Heavenly Father who had sent him, his kindness to all who were suffering, the love that they shared, how she felt when he told her, Mom, I love you, the laughter, the tears, the joy, the love they had shared throughout the years. She's remembering all of this, how he'd taken care of her when Joseph died. But perhaps, as a woman of Israel, she could also remember the beheading of John the Baptist, how the prophets of Israel had been stoned or beaten or tortured or killed from speaking the word of God to the Israelites. Could this be happening? You know how it feels when a situation is so horrendous you feel you might pass out like you can hardly take the next breath and yet you have to be strong because there's somebody there who needs you to be strong for them. They need you to be there. And let me tell you, Mary wanted to be there for Jesus, for her son, not yet realizing it was actually the other way around. Jesus was there taking the stripes upon his heart for her healing. His innocent blood was being shed for the forgiveness of her sins. Mary knew that he had the power to stop the whole thing, and yet he never said a word in his defense. He went like a lamb to the slaughter. How many prophecies were being fulfilled? How she must have prayed with tears streaming down her face as she put one foot in front of the other, wanting to be near her son, walking through the streets of that city, to the place of the skull, Golgotha, Calvary. Then she's there, and they're starting to put the nails through his hands and through his feet. The tears, the groans and the moans. Her whole body must have been quivering with the emotional pain she was feeling for her child. And once again, there's no miracle, there's no reprieve. That overwhelming sadness and horrible, it must have been almost unbearable. And then the cross is up and there is her son, beaten, almost unrecognizable, suffering. And people are laughing and making fun of him in his agony. A man who knew no sin had only done good for other people. And he's being taunted and humiliated. She must have wondered, where is this all going to end? And even then, in the depth of her horror and her pain and her heartbreak, and in the midst of Jesus' agony, Jesus looks down at his mother. And seeing her there, he looked at her. He loved her. She knew it. Their eyes met. While he was taking on himself all of our sin, all of our sickness, all of our pain, all of our suffering, all of our infirmities, while he's taking that on, hers, yours, and mine, he reached out of his own personal, horrendous, physical and emotional pain, and he loved her. He looked at her, and he spoke four words, four words that were so significant. Woman, behold thy son. You know that word in the Greek, behold, it's, not, it's more than look at. It's actual giving. It's a binding together. The verb is actually, it's a knitting together and a binding together. So it wasn't just like, here's your new son. You too now family. I'm giving you to each other. He was looking at her. He was looking at her life right now in her emotional need and in her physical need. He knew she needed someone. He wasn't about to give her to her other sons and daughters because they weren't believers yet. 
they were not sure that Jesus was who he said he was. But John the Beloved was. So he said, Woman, behold thy son. And at that moment, when he looked at Mary and he said those very words, Mary knew that Jesus loved her. And he was providing for her now and in the future. And then later she was to find him eternally. This was an eternal thing. She also know, he knew that he was honoring her as her, his parent. This was very important to the Jewish people. You know, even though we're no longer under the law of Moses, God's precepts are always the same. And honor thy father and thy mother was a very important one. And Jesus was honoring her as his parent. But you see, when he said that, feeling as loved and cared for as she was, there was another thing that would have gone through her mind. The horror of knowing this was reality. There wasn't going to be a reprieve. There was going to be no miracle. He was not going to come down off of that cross. He wouldn't be coming home tonight, not as her son, not as the reigning king of Israel, nor as the high priest. He was going to die. She must have experienced such horror and shock and pain. And yet, you see, this is the incredible thing about Mary. She put her faith in God. She knew her God through all those years. She knew that God had been in every detail. And let me tell you something. Sometimes that is all we have to hold on. You know, God is far more interested in our character than he is in our circumstances. Not that he's not interested in our circumstances. He loves us. He promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He is our provider. He suffered the way we have suffered, yet he never sinned. But see, he knows our infirmities. He knows our heartbreaks. But he wants us to put our faith in him. Because he is the only one that can provide eternally. You know, Mary, from that day on, she lived in John's home. Faithful, obedient Mary, learning to truly trust in God every step of the way. You know, I know that, Pastor, I don't know how much time I have. If I can have a couple more minutes to share about John. See, John was the other one. Jesus turned and looked at John and said, Behold thy mother. I'm giving you two to each other. Three simple words but holding a wealth of meaning for John. John's journey was very different than Mary's. John didn't meet Jesus until he was a grown man. He was a fisherman by trade. He had been nicknamed by Jesus as one of the sons of thunder. He was probably kind of rough around the edges, a little bit loud. But nevertheless, he was one of the three disciples that was closest to Jesus in, his, in Jesus' three and a half years of ministry. And although John had sat beside Jesus at the Last Supper, it shows you what God can do to one of the sons of thunder, doesn't it? Sitting and leaning against Jesus. But when the disciples had gone with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, John had fallen asleep, not once, but twice. And then when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, he ran. He abandoned Jesus when Jesus was in trouble. Son of thunder. It shows you how complex we can be, and one minute how, how strong we can be, and another minute how weak we can be. As Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. But you see, Jesus understands those things. So John, he had come to the cross. And see, that's an important thing to remember. He may have run away, but where did he come? He came to the cross, which is where we all need to come to. So John's standing there, feeling ashamed, guilty, maybe worthless. Angry? How had he let this 
happened? How had he betrayed Jesus? Why were people doing this to Jesus? And maybe kind of, kind of wondering why, with all the power that Jesus had demonstrated, why didn't Jesus stop this thing? And I'm sure he was really heartbroken to see his master and his friend in agony, hanging upon a torture stake. And I use the word torture stake because sometimes we say the word cross, and it doesn't really denote the depth of what Jesus went through for us. And that's why I like to use the word torture stake. But Jesus looks at John, and he says those loving, loving, forgiving words. Behold thy mother. John had a word from the word of God. Isn't that awesome? In that instant, John knew he was forgiven. He knew that Jesus loved him in spite of what he'd done. Jesus had not given up on him. In fact, Jesus was including him in his earthly family as well as his heavenly family by giving him the care of his mother. Once again, we need to look at the response of John. Standing at the cross, he received the word in his spirit and in his heart, and he acted on it, and he obeyed, because from that very day, he took Mary home to be with him. Who would ever have thought this would have happened, but then once again, God is in all of the details. Jesus, looking down with arms outstretched, he reached out and provided for a sorrowing, heartbroken mother and a young man who'd been his friend, who'd be, who had betrayed him, who had abandoned him. Forgiving John, loving them both. And what does that mean for us today? See, it doesn't matter how faithful we are or how sinful or cowardly we act. You cannot change the past. The thing is, we need to come to the cross, because that's where you hear Jesus speak. That's where you see the depth of the agony he went through. That's where you see he bore the wrath of God for us, and he speaks to us in love. Come to you all who are burdened, who are heavy laden, come to me, and I will refresh you, because my load is easy and light. Just as he provided for his mother, he'll provide for us. Just as he forgave John, wiping out all the shame and the guilt, he'll do the same for us. So, examine yourselves. What is your shame, your heartbreak, your fear, your lack, your want? And give it to Jesus at the cross. Let him take it. You know, you can be standing, looking up at Jesus at the cross, and when you give it to him, that's when you can turn around and you can face the world because you have just received his righteousness, his love, his peace, his joy, and you can give it out to others and be that Jesus to other people. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's what we need to remember. Trust him. Thanks.